Friday, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to start today with a journey to uh, South Georgia Island in the South Georgia Sea, uh, an, an imposing mountainous landscape. Uh, and these dots that you see on the beach here are king penguins, a larger and, and uh, more regal penguin than uh, the ones we, we've seen lately. So uh, when they are juveniles, they are neither large nor regal. They are uh, brown and fluffy, this one begging for, for food from a parent. Um, and they're just kind of uh, goofy looking, looking fuzzballs until they, until they get older, where they can perform uh, uh, sort of a, a royal procession like we see here. Uh, and they cluster together in these huge colonies on the beach. Uh, they also, of course, uh, court each other. Penguins uh, 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 have long-term uh, mates. And uh, something, I, I don't know how, but something that, that scientists have discovered is that uh, king penguins recognize each other through the sound of their call rather than visually. So even to, to king penguins, uh, all king penguins look the same. All right. Uh, what questions uh, do you have about uh, the current lab, recursion, anything that, that we've been working on? Okay. We were getting very stuck on the mouse up and mouse down. Can you just talk a little bit about how to approach that? Yes, so handling mouse clicks on this Enigma machine uh, is the tricky part of the lab from the object-oriented side. There are tricky parts from kind of doing the actual cryptography side, but the object oriented is, is making these mouse, uh, uh, mouse actions work. So we have Enigma main, which is what sets up these functions that detect when a mouse uh, click has happened. And the Enigma main checks what object, if any, was actually clicked on. And then uh, if something was clicked on, uh, This Enigma main will call the mouse down action method of whatever thing was clicked on. So, for example, user clicks on one of the keys, one of these Enigma key objects. The mouse down action of that Enigma key object is going to be called. What we want to happen when a key is clicked on, and, and this, at least in this first milestone, milestone four, is we want the lamp to light up, to show just whatever letter key was clicked on, we want that lamp to light up. So our Enigma main is going to our um, Enigma key, uh, uh, in the mouse down action in there. But our Enigma key doesn't know anything about the lamps of our Enigma machine, nor should it. It's just responsible for the key part. So what we want the what the Enigma key does know is what letter it is. It has self dot letter. And so how we're going to get the lamp to light up is we're going to call the method of a class that does know about the lamps. Uh, and that is our Enigma machine dot pi. This is the class that creates the keys, creates the lamps, creates the rotors, has a dictionary of the lamps, which you, I think is milestone three. And so Enigma key, this mouse down action, is called with a parameter enigma, which is a very the object, the enigma machine object. So our enigma key can call the 
key pressed method telling the Enigma machine what letter was pressed. And so this will send us over to our Enigma machine, which can then light up the lamp that corresponds to that letter. So this is one of the, the big things that we're practicing with this lab, is we have a bunch of different classes and objects of those classes that represent different pieces of our machine. And they need to communicate information and events with one another using these sort of one calls a method of another calls a method of another. Yeah, okay. Yeah, another thing with that. So in the write-up, there's like some code saying like it should, the implementation of mass and action should look like this. Is that something we should like copy paste or we should rewrite slightly differently? Uh, you might need to modify that depending on context, yes. Okay. Uh, are, you're, are you saying in, in main or in? Um, in, uh, in Enigma key. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so that you might, you might need to think about. Other questions on the, the, the structure of our, our lab? All right. I'll keep this awake. And I'd like to, to start out with some review on uh, our idea of recursive uh, functions and just make sure we're all feeling good about uh, some of this uh, terminology. So first, take a minute and think about what it is that, that makes a function recursive. What sets it apart? All right, we're uh, thinking that it calls itself as, as part of a, a definition. That's uh, indeed what's, what's going to make our, our function recursive when we uh, have some uh, function that's going to do a little bit of work and then leave the rest to some recursive call to an, another call to the same, same function. Questions on this? Here's another piece of important terminology. What is the role of a base case in a recursive function? All right, please uh, discuss with your neighbors both which, def uh, which definition you think is correct and also an example we've seen of a base case. All right, we're almost all in agreement that its, its purpose is to end our recursion to give us a point where we don't have any more work to do uh, and we can just uh, return without making a recursive call. Uh, can someone share one of the examples that came up in your discussion? Gabby. Okay, so we went back to just talking about the line example that we have discussed last time, where the example that we had was like a conditional thing. You are the person, like the first person, therefore, if you're function is returning zero because you have a message in front of you. That then returns the function and we you know that a return to the function ends the function. And so in this case because it's still being called within it, that still allows the other like the other values to still go through the function. So that stops calling it function. Yeah, that are when we thought about uh, recursive procedure to find out how many people were ahead of us in line. Exactly. Once we got to the front of the line, there was no one left to ask how many people are, are in front of you. And we also just knew what the answer was. There were zero people in front of us. Uh, and when uh, we looked at getting the length uh, of a list, Recursively, uh, we had a base case of when our list was empty, we knew how long it was, it was zero. And we didn't need to make a recursive call to find out how many more, more elements there were. Any questions on that? All right. 
Let's take a look at a recursive function, or an attempted recursive function anyway. So I tried to write a function to recursively reverse a string. So the idea is that if I said reverse string of cat, it would return the string tack. It would give me the string in reverse. So uh, take a minute and, and look at this code and consider what, uh, what are potential problems with this uh, recursive function. All right, a majority of you are thinking this is, this is full of problems. Uh, that is correct. It is full of problems. Uh, so I'd like you to discuss with your neighbors why each of these uh, uh, problems exists in this implementation. All right. What's, how about this first one? It will never finish. Why, why is that? Yes, we have no base case can how do we know there's no there's no base case here? Someone else articulate that. Jonathan? Uh -huh. There's no sort of conditional statement, which means for every value it's gonna do the same thing. So even if there was some sort of base case that would do it, it wouldn't Exactly. This function is going to do the same thing every time, no matter what our input, no matter what s is, it's going to make a recursive call. And so we'll always make a recursive call and, and, and never finish. So even if, say, we, we figure out how to solve that problem, we'd have other, other potential problems. Uh, so, how do we, how about it won't reverse the string? <clears throat> Anyone have, have thoughts they'd like to share about that? Gary? I mean, if we want it to reverse, we want to see two letters from the end, but we're slicing, still using a positive insert, which, or a positive index, which is going to fill from the beginning, so we would want a negative index if we want to start Going. Yeah, that's a good point about starting at the beginning. Uh, I think that it's not necessarily the slice that's at fault here. Uh, I call your attention to our S bracket zero. And let's think of this when we're doing cat. If S was cat, we're saying something like the first character C plus the rest reversed. Even if the rest reversed correctly, cat reverse does not start with C. I think the point about negative indexes is, is, is a good one. We want it to start with the last, our reverse string should start with the last character, not the first. How about this third problem, potentially causes an index error? If you run this, but you've got an empty list, and you try to slice, it's going to say, index error, you're trying to slice an empty list. So again, I think the slice will work fine. Uh, when we, we can actually slice an empty sequence, and it will just give us an empty sequence back. Again, our issue is s bracket 0. That's not a slice. That says, give me the thing at index 0. Well, if the string is, is empty, there is no index 0. That's an index error. We can tell because there's nothing checking here how long s is. There's nothing preventing us from doing s bracket 0, it, even if that index doesn't exist. All right. Questions on uh, these problems with, with this reverse string? All right, now it is your turn to fix my broken implementation. Uh, I would like you to 
uh, work with the folks around you to implement a correct recursive function that reverses the string. We're going to need to add a base case, and we're going to need to make sure that we're taking characters from the end of the string rather than the beginning. And uh, Dominic and I will be walking around uh, if you have questions. All right, let's work through this together. That's not what I wanted. So, as far as our base case goes, this is the point at which we just know, without having to do any work, what the reverse of the of the string is. So here I said if the string is empty, because if the string is empty, we know what the reverse of it is. It's just also empty. There's nothing to do. And so to put that in code, uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll ask you. Anyone have an idea of how to put this first base case part uh, into Python. Gary? I think that will work nicely. Was that your idea as well, Eva? Yeah, so if we have an empty string, we just return the reverse of that, also the empty string. And so, like many recursive functions, if we're not at the base case, we want to hand most of the work to a recursive call, which means that we make a call to the same function, reverse string, to do all but some small part of our task. And in this case, our, our line four here will we'll do that just fine. That we take the rest of our string, everything but uh, um, uh, uh, well, so there is actually a problem with line four here. Because we do want the thing at the end of the string to show up at the beginning. And so we can get the thing at the end of, the, of a string with an index of, of negative 1. Max? Or could you keep line 4 the same and then do first <coughs> plus S0? Uh, that is an interesting idea. Let's give that a try. Where we reverse everything but the first character and then say that part plus the first character at the end might be our, our string in reverse. Save the file. And we do see C tag. So this would be one way to think about it, that if we reverse everything but the first character, get that in reverse order, then we know the first character will be at the end of that reverse string. Anyone have other thoughts about a way, a way to approach this, reversing a string? What part we might reverse and what we might, uh, what little bit of work our, our recursive function might do? So there is the potential for us to say, okay, the last character is moving to the front, and then everything up to the last character is the part we want to reverse after that. So can anyone think of what slice would give us up to the last character, but not including that last character? John? Uh, after the first colon, just the negative one? Yeah, this 
start this slice starts at the beginning, goes up to, but does not include the last character. So I think this version will also reverse the string. So we can actually approach this kind of from either direction. All right, what are your, what are your questions on this? What was, what was hard about coming up with this, this recursive function that would be, be helpful to talk more about? Uh, Emma, did you have a question? No. Okay. So let's practice some more code reading of a recursive function. So uh, our our code writing is done. You can go ahead and, and close the the laptops. And here I have a. Um, uh, recursive function to sum uh, to, to sum the, the numbers in a list and uh, each time uh, uh, in this recursive function at some point I am printing out uh, this variable rest followed by a comma and a space. <laughs> so take a few minutes and uh, it might be very helpful to do this on paper using that sort of plates, stack of plates diagram that we talked about uh, last time um, in order to figure out what, uh, what will be printed out when this function is, is called. Our bottom plate is our initial call with 8, 4, 2, 1. And thinking about as we stack up these plates, where is the print and kind of what order will and what numbers will be printed out. All right, so different, different dots here, primarily B, uh, B or D. Um, so let's just work out what our uh, uh, kind of stack of plates are going to be as we go through uh, the recursion. So our first call uh, is our with our list 8421. Are we at our base case? No. Do we print or do we make a recursive call next? Recursive. Yeah, we make a recursive call and it's another plate. Uh, and what do what what do we provide as input? What's our parameter to that that recursive call? Max? The rest of the list starting at the second index. Yeah, so it's the list after our first element, our slice from index one to the end. So that's our four, two, one. <clears throat> Not at our base case. And again, we make a recursive call without before we print anything. So add another plate with the rest of our list to one. Still not at our base case, length of this list does not equal zero. Put on one, still not our base case. Finally, we slice this list from index one on, we get an empty list. We're at our base case. We can. Uh, what what do we do when we're when we're at the base case? Return zero. We return zero. So we send zero back to our previous call, which is assigning it to our variable rest. So we send zero back as the rest for this call, which then prints it out. So when this recursive call prints out rest, it's going to print 
zero. Now we pick up where uh, uh, we return back to this and picked up where we left off, which was our print. And now we're at a return. What does this recursive call here going to return? Yeah, why one? That's the variable assigned to rest, and it's the uh, last element in the list. Yeah, our, our rest is zero, and we add it to nums index zero, which we can see is one here. So this will then return one plus zero, or one, which is assigned to rest in our recursive call before that. We print that out, and then we return rest plus nums bracket zero. What's that going to be in this case? Yeah, it's going to be three, one plus two. We're back to where this was called, which is our rest equals uh, our recursive call. So right after that, we pick up where we left off and print out three, return three plus our first element of nums in this call, which three plus four is seven, print out seven, and finally return rest plus our first number 15, and that's this last print statement down at the bottom here that prints out the final return value from our, our initial call. So we're basically printing out the sum so far as we return from these recursive calls. So uh, there are uh, a couple uh, recursive functions on the, the quiz that's uh, out on, on Moodle. Um, so this sort of working through this kind of stack of plates diagram can be a good way to think about how a recursive function is, is going to work. And uh, like we did, like we see here, and like we did with reverse string, breaking it down into a base case and recursive case. Uh, what are your questions about about this recursive sum function? Ava. Hey. Well, I know this is wrong because obviously it's not correct. But um, when I was going through this, it seemed like it was printing rest every time. And so every time, so we start with the rest and we assign it a value. And then we should print that immediately and then con continue with the, with the things. Yeah, this is, this is a, a great point, and it's why these recursive functions can be tricky to wrap our heads around. That in this first call, we have our, our four element list, and we get to our, our rest equals rec sum of uh, something. That makes a recursive call. We go into rec sum called with this, these three elements. And we have to finish with that function call before we come back and keep going. Like if we uh, had um, uh, a function f that uh, called a function g and then printed the result of that. And our function g uh, has some um, huge for loop in it. This says, okay, go do the steps in G, and we have to finish with all those steps before we come back here and then print out the result. And the same thing is happening with this recursive function. It's just harder to see because it's the function is calling itself. And so when we call, make the recursive call, we have to finish with that before we will then print out what it, what it gives back. 
But then that one makes a recursive call, which we then have to finish before we get back to this one, before we get back to this one. So we end up going all the way down to our base case before we start returning from them, and only when we return from the recursive call do we print. So we end up, because the print is after the recursive call, we end up kind of printing from uh, our base case on, up, or, or down, whatever direction we want to say this is. Um, if the print was, if we were printing something before the base case, or before the recursive call, uh, we would see the print, and then it would go into this, and, and so on. Does that make sense? What other questions do you have? Yeah, well. <coughs> Oh, that's the function. You print rest, and then, but then when you call the recursive function, that also prints the recursive function. So when they print it twice. Uh, uh, Willow's question is: We print rest inside our our recursive function, but then we make a recursive call, which also prints rest. So shouldn't it print twice, kind of for for every call? Um, so if we just, ignoring the recursive part for a moment, if we look at this function, it has just a single print uh, statement in it. So every time we call, for every call that we make to Rexum, we would expect one thing to be printed out. And uh, as, we, as we saw, in order to, to, to sum up this four element list, our recursive function ended up making uh, one, two, three, four recursive calls. And so we did print out rest four times. Once for each of these recursive calls that we made, and then this line at the very end prints out the final result, 15. So uh, we're printing out once each time our function is called, but we to get down to our base case, we made four recursive calls. So it prints out rest four times. Uh, the different um, uh, uh, the the with the, the different values it has in each of those recursive calls. Does that answer your question? Yeah, maybe. So I have a question about like the functionality of this function because we wanted to sort of record the sums as we go along each sort of element. Uh, so shouldn't like the output be like reverse? Shouldn't it start from fifteen and go up to zero, and then is that just mean changing like uh, the sort of slicing in the uh, in the input when you're reversing the final function? Um. Yeah. So th that's that's an, an interesting question. If we're uh, kind of printing the 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 sums. Uh, would we expect uh, the full sum to be printed first and then the uh, part of it and then a smaller part and then a smaller part? Um, and so the reason that we see the numbers come out in this order is because we print only when our recursive call returns. So our initial call makes a recursive call and it doesn't get to that print until that call returns. But then that call makes a recursive call, which makes a recursive call, which makes a recursive call. In this one, we're at our base case, so we return zero. And now we're back to this call, and it proceeds to the print. So we actually end up kind of printing out our sum so far from kind of the, the deepest recursion on up. Uh, so this is also showing us the kind of order in which this sum is happening. We first get zero, and then one, and then we add these two, because each time we're, our recursive function, function is saying, OK, I'll take care of adding the first element if the recursive call takes care of adding up the rest of them. Right? I can do that one addition as long as the recursive call has done the rest of the work. And so each time we're, it's showing us, like, this is what the this is the work the recursive call did. Now I, after printing that out, I'll do my work, add the first element to the sum of the rest, 
and return that. So does that make sense why we see it in this order? All right. I think that will do it for today. Um, if you are interested in having a partner for the final project, but you do not currently have a partner for the final project, please stop by up here uh, before you leave, and we'll see if we can uh, uh, make, make some partnerships. Otherwise, uh, have a good weekend. Uh, the quiz is on Moodle. I will see you Monday.